Thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure for me to be uh, with you today uh, for presenting this, uh, this topic and listening to your interest about data science for biomanufacturing. I will start by sharing my screen. Here it is. Normally, you should see this, the, the, the welcoming screen presentation for my uh, seminar. And before initiating the discussion, uh, we'll start by a few questions of a small poll, just to figure out a little bit who is in the room uh, today and what are the, um, the expectations. The question should now pop on your screen. I invite you all to answer the questions. So the first question is about your job profile. Try and find the best, uh, the best category that you uh, fit into. And the second is about the challenge that you perceive as the highest for implementing data science or data analytics within the framework of your activities. Leave a little bit of time for you all to answer. And then we'll slowly move into, okay, here are the answer. Oh, interesting, interesting. So we have lots of people from quality, some people, uh, some business people as well as other profiles. And then you perceive as the leading uh, drawback or challenge is the lack of internal qualifications for uh, implementing data science. Well, I hope that this seminar will uh, give you a little more insight and a little more qualifications uh, on those respects to initiate some data science journey within your organization. So let's now start the the presentation. Uh, just to trigger the topic, I would say that uh, there's, there's no need to emphasize the role and the importance of data uh, in the biomanufacturing context. There are plenty of data that are produced and harvested all along the, uh, the, the, the manufacturing process. Uh, those data are usually stored or handled by a multiplicity of uh, IT systems. And unfortunately, as of today, the primary role of data is to serve regulatory purposes. The data are stored and made available for quality audits or for reviews or for ensuring that the GMP uh, effort is performed uh, in a right way. And my goal with the seminar of today is to demonstrate that beyond those regulatory uh, aspects, data have a value and may materialize some business value for your organization. That's really the key topic of today. And I will start by reminding a few uh, basic con uh, concepts. We'll talk a lot about modeling algorithms, functions uh, today. And so it's worth to uh, remind a little bit of the basics. Let's assume that you work with one, one, one quantity uh, that is expressed in terms of one variable. You have a distribution uh, as uh, represented on the screen, which is the result of a number of experiments. And you want uh, you, your goal is to identify the, 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 optimum, the optimal value of that variable, which maximizes or minimizes in some situations the, uh, uh, the quantity of interest. Well, in general, what you will do is to build a mathematical model, a mathematical representation that is best matching the experimental points that you have harvested. Once you have been producing that mathematical function, you will qualify that mathematical function, for example, by computing the residuals between the uh, experimental points and the mathematical function. And once you are satisfied with the mathematical representation that you have, you'll start by ex exploiting the model. And for example, you will identify the quantity in the horizontal axis, which leads to the um, the maximum value on the uh, vertical axis. And by doing so, you identify the optimal value of your targeted quantity. That's bread and butter of uh, optimization. It's already becoming a little more challenging when you have a quantity which is expressed not in one single variable, but in more than one single variable. In this situation, you see a quantity in, uh, which is expressed in terms of two 
variables, it's already difficult to visualize it properly and to identify the, the variations of that quantity with respect to the um, to the variables up front. But this is still something that you may identify through uh, the traditional mathematical modeling. By doing so, you already identify something which is new with respect to the previous situation. The fact that you may have not only local minima, but also global uh, minima or maxima, but also global maxima. The fact is that you, uh, you have optimal values that are not single optimal value, but you may have more than one uh, top or bottom as you are targeting. That's the situation when you do with more than one variable. In a biomanufacturing con uh, context, it's becoming highly more complex because you have a problem with thousands of variables. And with such a situation, it's really complicated to perform the modeling effort, so to say, to identify a representation of the situation that you will use for identifying the optimal situations. The problem arises because when you have that many variables, actually you have not one representation which is valid, but you may identify plenty of those uh, representations. You may identify plenty of models that are good with respect to the retrospective data that you have available. Uh, but the problem with those models is that in general, they will poorly generalize when you try to predict something uh, prospectively. Uh, and one solution to address this, uh, uh, this situation with a very high number of variables is to call for machine learning techniques. And the machine learning techniques that will be described further into this presentation have to be, of course, applied with the appropriate methodology. Uh, in a nutshell, the overall methodology remains the same, meaning that we'll start by building a model. Once we have the, that model, we will qualify the model with respect to a number of merit factors. We'll give some examples on that. And once the model is considered as satisfactory, then you will exploit the model to identify the, um, the situations with the optimal performance as per your expectations. So let's start by uh, looking at uh, by a manufacturing process in a very simplistic way. It's uh, broken down here in the slide in four uh, major phases. The situation is, of course, more complex, but let's simplify the situation like that. And let's uh, state that we want to improve the yield of the manufacturing process. So that's the target, that's the objective that we aim at. We want to maximize the yield of that process. If we want to do that, the first thing to do is to bring all the data that are harvested all along the process. We, we get uh, um, different types of data at different stages of the process. I'm naming a few of those data here on the screen. Down the road, you will end up with a few thousands quantities that are harvested, not only for one batch, but ideally for plenty of batches that have been produced or, uh, already. The first challenge is to aggregate different data with different natures. As you can see, we have formats which are simple numbers, the batch ID, for example. We have time series, so measurements that are performed every minute or every uh, hour for a long duration. You have timing, you have text information, plenty of different uh, natures of the data. As an additional complexity, the data are being usually stored in different systems. You have information from the raw material that are available from the ERP. Uh, the in-process data may be stored, may be archived on historian uh, databases. You may want to look at the batch record. You have uh, quality systems that are typically located in LIMS uh, systems. It, these are just a subset of the IT systems that are usually uh, made uh, available for storing all those data. And the first challenge is to bring all those data together and to contextualize those data into a comprehensive data model, as we, as, as we call it. Another point uh, on which uh, some important effort has to be made is to look at the, the data and see whether the data are representative or if additional data need to be defined. For example, if you look at uh, timing value, you may want, for example, uh, to replace the start and stop 
time of some operations by the overall duration. Uh, and that's uh, the process of defining additional derived variable. All those efforts aiming at grouping the data, connecting to the different systems and processing the data to extract the more meaningful variables are overall described as data engineering. Once we have performed this data engineering, we end up with a large data set, plenty of data all along the process for multiple batches. And that's the input for our modeling effort. Then we can do this modeling effort and the modeling effort aims at two things. The first objective during the modeling is to find this mathematical representation, this uh, digital model that best represent uh, the process. The second is to identify also the subset of the variables that are the more interesting to look at when we want to play with the model and reach the best performance of the tar targeted endpoint. And this is an iterative process. Typically, we look at the uh, input data set. We'll break this data set in two parts, say 80% of the data set that will be used uh, for training the model, then 20% of the, the, the data that will be used uh, for, uh, for testing, for validating the model. We do that a large number of time, not only for elaborating the model, but also for qualifying, for sorting out the, uh, the, the variables of interest. Those variables of interest in the next part of my presentation, I will sometimes call uh, them as predictors. We call predictors the vari variables that have a, an, an, an interest in adjusting the quantities for reaching the best performances. Once the model has been produced, then we qualify the model according to a number of merit factors. The best merit factor or the most obvious one is the accuracy of the model. Of course, you want the model to best represent the tendency, the evolution of the, uh, of the target. But that's not the only uh, merit factor that you may want to qualify. For example, you may evaluate the robustness of the model. And uh, uh, here on the screen, you have a number uh, of uh, quantities index that are being used for qualifying, say, the robustness of the model, for example, uh, meaning that the model will be robust if uh, it remains uh, reliable when you add up or remove uh, some of the variables that are being used for constructing the model. So you build the model and then you qualify the model according to a number of indicators. When you've done that, you look, you, you may start performing some, some analysis. And the first thing that you may look at is the quantities, the subset of variables that are being uh, perceived as interesting, as valuable for adjusting the model in view of optimizing the target. Uh, some of those variables you may access them, you may, uh, you may adjust them during the process. Some others are not accessible, not actionable. Let's take the, the example of the temperature into a bioreactor. This is something that you can play with uh, just by adjusting the, uh, uh, the, the regulation of the, the bioreactor. In opposition, if uh, the model identifies the, uh, the acidity, the pH within the bioreactor as an important quantity. In general, you cannot directly adjust the acidity quantity, but you may adjust uh, other quantities that in turn have some influence on that acidity. And that's the concept of direct uh, actionable variable or associated variab variables, which is re represented in the um, the diagram that you see on the screen, which is a kind of a flower, which maps in blue the variables that have a direct influence with respect to the target quantity, say the yield, for example. And if you cannot access the blue quantities, you may have some associations with other variables highlighted in red, which are the, uh, the, the, the other quantities that are indirectly related to the most important parameters and that you may want to play with in view of adjusting uh, the, the end quantity. Overall, when you have that model, you may start performing the optimization process, meaning that you will look at the best values of the uh, predictors that lead to an enhancement of the target quantity, in the present case, the yield. If you see on the graph, the optimization process ends up into a window of value, which is higher than the maximum uh, 
uh, of the curve indicating that indeed the model reached higher yield, higher performance. As an additional information, you may highlight, for example, the fact that some of the data in your retrospective data set, here presented in blue on the graph, are effectively uh, present in the data set, meaning that the target situation that you want to implement has been met already in previous uh, batch configurations. This is giving you some uh, uh, reliability on the recommendation that you get. Overall, you will qualify the recommendation uh, for improving your process through a number of indicators. The externality, as I was mentioning, is the ability to play directly with the predictors in view of implementing the targeted um, the target situation. Uh, the, 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 the consistency with uh, the, the, the range, uh, the, the tolerated range is, for example, if you uh, highlight a value uh, on a process which has already been registered, uh, then the question that you will ask is whether the new configuration that is proposed by the model, is it compatible with the registered value of the process, or is it getting you outside of the registered value, meaning that either you cannot or you have to register the process once again, which you may not want to do for uh, business reasons. So this kind of information may be qualified also through the kind of analysis that is being proposed. And finally, we may qualify the recommendations in terms of the novelty. A recommendation will be novel if it's hitting an area of the design space in which you do not have lots of value from the retrospective data set, meaning that's a configuration that has not been implemented or not a lot in uh, the batches that have been used for training the model. And in a position, the, no the novelty will be low if it's hitting a part of the design space in which you have already lots of or a high number of uh, values that have been implemented in previous, uh, in previous batch configurations. As a matter of fact, if you have a low novelty, you will have a higher confidence in the recommendation that are being proposed to you. What you see here is really the analysis of a recommendation following the optimization of the process based on the endpoint, which is in that situation, the, uh, the yield of the process. So you see which value of the yield you will be willing to get in order to have higher performance. This recommendation can be translated into the uh, impact for all the key variables, the key quantities that are used as predictors. And the same way in terms of a graphical representation, uh, the system may highlight the uh, interval, the boundaries in which the recommendation is being set for every individual quantity. And in blue, there is the possibility to represent whether uh, these configurations have been obtained already within the retrospective data, or if this is something which is completely new and not identified in uh, retrospective data. That's something that you may have for looking at uh, one configuration. This is typically the kind of output that is being proposed to the process experts. Process experts will look at all the impact for, for all the variables, and they will decide whether it's worth or not, whether it's possible or not, to implement this new rec uh, reconfiguration and try and obtain better performance. Actually, the, uh, as I was mentioning in the introduction, when you start working with model with multiple variables, you don't have one single optimum value, but you may have a variety of local optima. It translates into this setting uh, in a situation in which you have not only one recommendation, but a set of recommendations. You have different scenarios, different improvement scenarios that you may leverage to, uh, to try and improve the yield of your system. So every single recommendation may be qualified exactly the way it has been uh, presented uh, in the previous slides. So you may see the improvement in the target quantity. You may see whether it represents something which has been done already uh, in the retrospective batch data set. And you can see whether every impact on every individual variable is 
reliable and realistic or not. And when you adjust, when you look at all those recommendations next to one another, uh, the process experts may usually decide which recommendation is the most reliable, the most uh, interesting to be implemented in a real situation. That's a trade-off that needs to be performed by the experts. The system is producing multiple recommendations and then the experts are deciding which of those recommendations are worth being uh, implemented in reality. Uh, that's all about process uh, improvement. So in a nutshell, summarizing the key aspects, process improvement starts by consolidating the data from a production history into a comprehensive data set, which concentrates all the data uh, belonging to a given manufacturing process, those data that have been captured from the existing subsystems, from the raw material down to the qualification of the final product, including all the in-process quantities and all the batch record quantities that can be harvested in the middle. When this comprehensive data set is being constructed, then the first effort consists in training machine learning models to have a digital model of the manufacturing process and qualify this model according to a number of merit factors. When that model has been produced and qualified, then it can be used through multivariate optimization techniques to identify various re uh, recommendations. These recommendations will give recipes or sets of parameters that can lead to a, a process with better performance. Those recommendations are again qualified through a number of merit factors and, and we can compare different such recommendations and pick the one which is considered as the most valuable or the most uh, promising for being implemented in, pra in practice. That's for optimization, but that's not the only thing that can be done on the basis of a consolidated data set. And I'm here emphasizing two other uh, realizations that can be performed on the basis of, of such consolidated data set. First is the qualification, the univariate qualification of all the quantities that are attached to a process. You can look at all the quantities one by one, look at the statistical distribution of all individual quantities, and for example, perform some kind of systematic validation of your CPPs, your critical process parameters. This is something that can be done in a very systematic way once the data set has been collected. Another interesting feature that can be built on that, on that kind of data set is the elaboration of what we call a golden batch model. Golden batch model is just a representation of a batch which is elaborated on the basis of the, uh, the batches that are considered as the best, uh, the best production batches uh, that have been done within the organization. Once this golden batch has been identified, then it is possible to perform a number of additional uh, investigations, like the, the detection of outliers with respect to specific quantities, or the elaboration of some trending evaluations, as you can see on the screen. All those investigations have a value, for example, for performing periodic uh, process quality reviews. And again, once all the data have been put together, the implementation of all those mathematical investigations can be done in a very systematic way and can be produced and be archived in uh, documents that are automatically generated and can easily simplify the effort, the, the quality uh, effort, the audits, and the overall management of the process. That's for the technical aspects. The question that you may ask, of course, is, uh, is it worth the effort? Does it materialize into valuable results? Well, the answer is yes, of course. Uh, it has been investigated already. So the, the, the notion of data science and process improvement through uh, advanced mathematics and advanced data science techniques is something which is uh, emerging since a couple of years. It has been the subject of investigations uh, by uh, auditing companies which highlighted through a number of different examples, uh, some overall improvement of the performance of the yield of the process, if this is the indicator. Other indicators could be considered 
as the um, the endpoint. For example, uh, you may decide not to improve the yield, but to enhance or the quality uh, indicator, or to reduce the overall process time. For example, these are just examples of things that you may want to do on the basis of such consolidated data set. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it translates also into a, a significant cost reduction uh, for the performance of the factory. This is something that came out of uh, the analysis of several use cases by auditing companies. We have met these uh, the, 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 the same order of magnitudes of improvement by uh, monitoring the improvement of the performances uh, with some clients that have trusted us in the implementation of such methodology. So this is something that is materialized also with, with our partners. And that's it for the presentation. I realize I've been perhaps a little bit fast on some aspects. I hope it was interesting and, um, and clear for you. If you have questions, uh, I will be happy to answer your questions. But before we hand over into the Q&A session, there are a few other questions that will pop up on your screen and that I'm inviting you to answer. So the first question rely, uh, relates to the very objectives. In my presentation, I focused on three major functionalities. First, about data consolidation. The, sub about, uh, the second, about monitoring the process. And the third, which was the main part of the talk, about the analysis and the improvement of the performance based on your reality and the job that you are having on a daily basis. What looks the most attractive for you? That's the question one. Then the question two is about the interest within the overall product development life cycle. In your opinion, uh, type of methods that I've presented today, uh, are there more, most interesting in process development, in routine operations, or in other uh, efforts like tech transfer or the upgrade or development of new production lines? That's the question two. And the question three anticipates what could get out of today's webinar. So, uh, and, and it will help also uh, evaluating whether my presentation was clear or not. So following that keynote, do you see an interest in your organization? Do you see some good matching with company objectives? Or as a second possibility, do you see an interest, but you need to have further discussion internally to align with different stakeholders? Or maybe at a, low, or maybe at a lower level, you find it somehow inspiring, but you need additional discussions and additional uh, exchanges to figure out what to do with this kind of uh, methodology. Maybe this is not something in your uh, daily work and you will pass the word to some of the colleagues. Or maybe as a possible last situation, you get the message, but you don't believe it's valuable or interesting uh, within your organization. So let's wait for another couple of moments to let you answer. I see that some questions are progressively popping up in the chat. Okay, so in a nutshell, the key interest is really about the in-depth analysis which is good because it was the, uh, the core value and the core topic of the presentation. The value lies in routine operations, which is obviously better also from a data science perspective, because if we talk about routine operations, we may directly leverage the history, uh, the production history, and have significant number of batches that can serve 
for elaborating the model. So that's really a good news for me, I would say. And in terms of the, the follow-up, well, it will uh, require from the majority of you, it will require additional uh, brainstorming and discussions internally. Uh, as was mentioned by Linda at the very beginning, the webinar was registered. So definitely uh, I remain most available to you and your teams for having additional discussions. My email address should be uh, uh, appearing on the screen. So do not hesitate uh, either to ask questions now uh, during the Q&A or to contact me afterwards or to pass the word to other colleagues and, and reconnect for, um, for further questions. Thank you, Damien. And so if anyone would like to unmute themselves and contribute suggestions or comments or questions, please do so or post your questions in the chat box as well. Hi, Damien, this is Pierre. Um, I have a question Hello. for you, uh, maybe for uh, personal experience, but also maybe you can share with us. Uh, from, from those data projects, right, my experience is that um, the, the one of the challenges, especially in the pharma, is to get access to the data, right? It's to uh, structure those data and be able to clean them, and that's where you spend a good uh, ballpark where you're like 70% of your time to get your data set ready for uh, for your model. So what would be um, today or in the future, you think the enabler that will allow those data to be uh, more easily available for uh, for doing mathematical model like you are doing? Yeah, well, that's a very, uh, very good question. Um, well, I would say it depends on the way you uh, you consider this kind of um, of project. If you if you look at that project from a one shot perspective, uh, typically you will have experts within the organizations that will connect and extract the data. Uh, well, most of the IT systems that I've been mentioning are built upon uh, modern uh, databases uh, in uh, in in the back part. Of the software, so it's uh, it's usually possible to connect to those systems and extract the data. So either we run this kind of project as a one-shot operation, then we will consolidate one data set and use it for the modeling effort. Or if we look at this from a more continuous perspective, we may build software connectors. Uh, between the consolidated database and these isolated systems and have a process in which the data are fetched continuously and fed into the data set, um, the, the data set on, a, on, on a continuous basis. So these are the two ways of approaching that situation. But it's true that uh, when setting up this kind of project, there is an important effort upfront in shaping up the data model in organizing the data and fitting all the data to have the proper um, organization of those data altogether and to have the proper contextualization of the data. This is an effort which is usually performed with the help of the process expert. So in all situations, you have a master batch description or a master process description file, which represents the overall process with all the data that are being harvested at the different levels, at the production on the one hand, at the quality on the other hand. And by bringing all those uh, pieces of knowledge together, we may elaborate a backbone of the data model, which is then be used and be fed with the data that are being harvested over the different systems. That's typically the way we do it. But you're right saying that this is usually an important effort, especially the first time we do it, it may require a first, uh, a first effort upfront, which should not be neglected. That's perfectly true. And when you assess, you know, the feasibility of uh, getting those, um, those data for your model, what will be, I would say, the plus factor, you would say, okay, like for me, I see that Pi historian or something like that would definitely be something positive. And any manual action is something that, you know, any paper batch record will be a no-go because translating those into a, into a data set would be um, too... Um, uh, too cumbersome, yeah. 
Well, as a matter of fact, all the information which is already in the digital format uh, is easier to consolidate with the, uh, the other, uh, with the rest of the data. Uh, I would say two comments on uh, on your uh, on your comment. First is that there is no uh, no no bad moment or no moment which is too early for initiating that uh, that kind of effort. What I mean is that we may start already by performing a model on the basis of a restricted set of the data which are easily accessible, while other data from the process might not be easily available. As you said, because they are, uh, for the time being, uh, typically uh, uh, consolidated on paper uh, formats. So we may start by what we have, and then, depending on the strategy, depending on the evolution of the techniques, we may update the models in a later stage by incorporating additional data sets. There's never a bad moment for initiating this, and there is always uh, valuable knowledge that is being extracted, even with restricted of data. But it is being true that if we want to go uh, further, uh, we may need to, uh, to access uh, additional uh, developments, additional, maybe sometimes manual efforts in translating data that are paper-based onto digital formats. And this may come with an overhead of effort. And this comes on a case-by-case -case basis. We'll usually have a discussion whether we believe that some of that data set uh, is expected to be highly impacting and is worth being translated into the digital format, or if we may continue working with the model, which is just a subset of the knowledge about the process. That's a, that assessment is done by uh, MSAT people or process knowledgeable people that have a good understanding, or it's an assessment you do purely based on uh, your mathematical model? That's a joint effort. That's typically a joint effort. Uh, we, we typically produce a, a, first, uh, a first version of the model, which is being discussed with, uh, with them SAT experts. And we, we jointly decide whether uh, some, uh, some elements of the model are, are obvious, uh, the dependencies that are being obvious. Some others are, uh, are usually not containing valuable information and could be discarded uh, right from the start. Uh, or, or we incorporate additional knowledge that we that we can inherit from the MSAT expert. That's really dialogue. Yeah, the, the reason I'm asking is because you know I, I've been attending a, a few talks on data and other, and one of the comments I remember is to say that if you have a large number of data, um, you will find correlation between those data even though they don't exist. Right? And that's where having an understanding of the model could be useful. And the other is that we have people saying that data analysts do not need to understand the reality. They just look at the data. So where does the, the reality lies? Well, I realize I've, I may have been a little bit too fast during the, the keynote about those aspects. It's really not about identifying the correlations, because indeed, as you were saying, uh, when you have large number of data, you will always find correlations, but those correlations might just me be meaningless, meaning that you will not general, generalize information on a prospective way. That's a, that's a reality. But the way we construct the model in the present approach is completely different. We go in an iterative process using machine learning techniques, and we identify the model that best represents the situation, and we identify also a subset of quantities, which are the key process drivers, the key quantities that are worth being looked at to uh, perform this kind of optimization. So I would say it's, uh, once again, it's, it's a dialogue between data scientists and, uh, and process experts. Uh, it's, 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 it is true that uh, typically our data scientists will explain and justify why some models are preferred than others, while some mathematical techniques are being used rather than others. And they will uh, learn from the dialogue with process experts whether the conclusions that are being produced by the models are relevant and are meaningful from a process and CMC perspective. Of course, we gain some time uh, uh, in, in that effort because our data scientists 
with the effort that they have conducted already through a number of similar projects, have now some knowledge also in manufacturing processes. And so they, they are able to extract also some, uh, some consistency out of the information without necessarily accessing the, uh, the expertise of the MSAT experts. But this problem of handling the data is really the specificity that we propose and the specific methodology built upon machine learning that, uh, that is being used for constituting those models. This is not just looking at correlations. Correlations, if you want to simplify the situation, is what I was mentioning at the very end of my presentation when I was talking about the univariate models and the statistical analysis uh, of quantities all one by one. This is something that can be done and that can be that can provide some confidence over the CPPs. That's valuable for confirming a number of efforts that have been performed already. But this processing of the data, the optimization and the enhancement of the processes comes with methods that are, that are more complex and more demanding in terms of data science. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Um, we have a question from Srinivas who asks, total how many features selected for building model and total batches? <laughs> well, it, it, it depends from one situation to the other. Uh, in typical situations, I would say that if we start having uh, more than uh, hundreds or uh, around 100 features, the model cannot be processed properly by human beings and evaluated by human beings. So typically we'll target uh, models that restrict the data set down to hundreds or sometimes few hundreds uh, representative features. But we may constrain the model and, and ask the model to materialize or to extract the 10 or 20 leading features. This is something that we can, uh, that we can ask to the model uh, in order to have more specific uh, type of assessment. So that's that's a parameter that we can control when elaborating the model. Srinivas, I hope that that answers your question. And then yeah, have... yeah, yeah, it's okay. Great, thank, thank you. you. And then uh, can, have... can I yeah. ask you one thing? Uh, how to avoid the covariance of the manufacturing data for regarding these features, right? Uh, so again, I heard about How to avoid the covariance of the data. I'm afraid the, com the communication is, the, the sound doesn't pass very well. <laughs> I didn't get the question, sorry. I'm messaging. I think he's going to write it on the uh, how to avoid covariance in in features. Mm. Well, that's that's one way of uh, of uh, evaluating uh, the models to to uh, to evaluate the covariance. So again, there are techniques to associate to to identify the primary variables and to uh, to evaluate uh, secondary variables. Remind the flower graph that I was presenting, which is uh, highlighting the capability of extracting the features with a dominant um, influence and then associate other variables uh, that, that are somehow related to the primary quantities. Uh, that's again by doing this iterative uh, evaluation process and running the, the learning process a large number of times that we can extract the best co uh, commonalities, extract uh, the biases like covariance as, as being mentioned. This is fully a part of the uh, modeling and evaluation process. I hope I, I'm answering the question. Thank you. Yes, I think that's got that. Um, Keith Yang asks, um, may I ask how could data analytics be applied to reduce deviations? And also could it be applied in other manufacturing processes, for example, other pharmaceutical dosage forms or medical devices apart from biomanufacturing? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, the interest of doing so in biomanufacturing is, uh, is primarily to highlight dependencies that are complex and multivariate, whereas 
uh, a, a chemical process is usually pretty well described and does not bring or bring lower variability or uh, variable unknowns. But, but as soon as you want to look at a data set from a data science perspective, you can do that even if you have uh, some a priori knowledge uh, over the process. And then there are techniques, there are um, uh, techniques that can be used for embedding this, um, this a priori knowledge into the model to have a faster convergence into uh, a valuable model. To the first part of the question uh, about reducing deviations, uh, the answer is yes. Once again, once we have this kind of model, uh, the model can be used, for example, for elaborating statistical distributions of specific quantities. And then uh, the, de the deviations will naturally uh, pop up as outliers. So this is pretty, pre pretty easy to identify when the model is being elaborated um, for, for, for a given process. And then we have visualization techniques uh, that are being uh, implemented for reporting the information pretty easily on screen. So the outlier detection, trending detection, and anticipation of, um, of uh, critical deviations is something that can be extracted out of this kind of um, analysis as well. Thank you. Kisiang, do you have any comment or um, is, does that answer your question? Got it. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments or um, experience to share? Or are there any other questions? Well, I, I can go all night, right? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Pierre. Um, just to understand, because we saw in the poll that a lot of people will need to, you know, regroup and think of uh, how they can apply what you just present, right? What would be your recommendation if you had to have a, a steering committee or a, a, you know, a, a team of people? What would be the skill of those people using our best to... Uh, to start such a project, right? What are the, like the enabler would be the, the data, but then in terms of uh, knowledge, which profile would you look to talk to? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question. In general, uh, MSAT uh, profiles have the deepest uh, insight into those questions because that's really their role to look at the processes from a critical perspective, either to develop new processes or to enhance the processes uh, that are being uh, implemented already. Uh, that being said, the translation of an MSAT profile may differ from one organization to the other, but uh, from a high level perspective, that's probably from uh, this kind of profiles that would come uh, very uh, valuable discussions and discussions could go uh, on plenty of different topics. Uh, what would be the expectation in, in, in terms of the optimization is one key question. I've performed the, uh, I prepared the, the slide deck by providing the example of a yield optimization effort. That's one typical example that can be addressed by these data science approaches, but other questions uh, can be addressed also in terms of process transfer, uh, process upgrade, comparison between different processes uh, and creation of families of process. Those are very exciting questions and we would be very much uh, open to discuss with different expert groups in terms of what could be done uh, with the kind of techniques that have been presented today. Okay, and um, again, uh, from, from, from experience, do you generally then include people from automation, IT, or, you know, to help you to access the data? Uh, we have some dialogue with them. In, in general, they are not uh, that much uh, involved in setting up the specifications or the requirements of a project but they are uh, requested to, uh, to help us access the data. So typically we'll talk with automation uh, people and uh, have their support for accessing 
the data from the historian database will get the, the appropriate access into the uh, IT servers for connecting to the other systems. Uh, either we'll implement the connectors by ourselves or they will develop the connectors and share the data with us. So we have some technical discussions when implementing um, a project. But typically, the, the request, the, the expectation, the high level objectives of this kind of project are discussed either with MSAT people or in some situations with people from the production or the quality management that are aiming at some kind of operational excellence initiative in their respective teams. Those are also very valuable profiles uh, to have on board for setting up this kind of project, by the way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Damien. Are there any other questions, comments? Please unmute if you like or put it in the chat. This is your last chance to, to get your questions in. Um, thank you, Damien, for sharing your expertise and time with us this uh, afternoon, morning, your time. Uh, we also have posted up a link for your feedback. Um, so we want to improve for further sessions and also have any suggestions for, for future, future Technical Tuesdays or webinars. Please do take the time to fill in those quick questions for us if you can. But otherwise we have seven minutes. If there's no, no other questions, uh, questions or uh, comments, we will let Damien go and start the rest of his day. Um, let's see, just one mm -hmm. question just popped up. Well, let me thank uh, Pierre and No Deviation team as well as you uh, within uh, ISPE Singapore team for setting up that meeting and inviting us to present this kind of uh, project. Thank you for the, uh, uh, to, to the audience for, the, uh, for, for your presence today and these valuable questions. As I was saying, I remain mostly open for answering additional questions and teaming up with you in making this a reality within your organization. Thank you, Damien. And uh, thank you to everybody for uh, tuning in this afternoon. As mentioned, the session has been recorded and will be saved in the ISPE Singapore Affiliate YouTube page. So do go ahead and uh, catch the beginning if you missed it. And uh, we thank everybody for joining. And Damien, thank you. I hope that we get to see you again um, in the not too distant future. And uh, congratulations on the 10 years of uh, DN Analytics. And yeah, and thank you very much. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining. And we wish you a good rest of evening. And Damien, for you, for the, the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.